Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy. We're starting a two-day series today. I'm going to talk about when will evil ever come to an end? With all the things we're seeing happen in the world around us, this is the question. It's even asked in heaven by the martyrs under the altar. When, Lord, will you finally resolve this entire situation? We're going to talk about it from the Word of God. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Great to have you here today. I'm doing another one today and this possibly might go on into tomorrow on end times. And that's why I'm offering the book on end times. And I've been offering book on end times for quite a while. But basically, this is the major question on people's hearts today, on people's minds today. What is going on? The reason why I want to bring this to you is because honestly, across our country, literally around the world, there is such biblical ignorance among Christians. They've depended on everybody else to get the word to them. They don't even open up the Bible for themselves. I want to admonish you, don't do this with this broadcast. Study what I'm giving you. Go back over your notes notes and don't become biblically illiterate. Don't just take somebody's word for something that the Bible means this or what's that. Go look it up for yourself. In fact, you'll find with many of the things being taught today, many things being said today, if you just go look up the scripture they're talking about, it doesn't say that. And so they, you know, they immediately say, well, the Holy Spirit said, and this is that. And, and they start again coming across as knowing so much, but they really don't know much, but they're taking advantage of a generation that is so biblically ignorant today. Don't be part of it. The well, Bible warns about this. That in the last days, there's going to be such ignorance of the Word of God and people will not know where to stand on the Word of God. Today, I want to start with Matthew chapter 24. We're going to take a look at verse 12. And I'm going to br bring to this is when is this ever going to end? When is this madness going on around the world, such ignorance of the Word of God among Christians, but also among sinners taking advantage and a world system being established around us. And we see all the things of sex, slavery, abortions, uh, baby parts being sold, all these things, Christians beheaded. We see these things happening and wonder, Lord, when is it going to stop? I'm taking this from a statement that's brought out in the book of Revelation, where they are the souls that are under the altar, the martyrs that have been killed on the earth or in heaven under the altar. They're crying out, when, O oh Lord, are you going to justify this? Even in heaven, they're asking the same question of when is this going to turn around? When is this finally going to come to an end? All I can say is the Bible is filled with information on it, when it's going to happen. The point of it is, is you must develop patience until the time of the rapture of the church is still going to continue to get worse. Then during the time of the tribulation, while we're in heaven, it's going to get even worse on the earth. That's why we need to win as many souls as possible every day so they can go to heaven with us when Jesus comes back for us. This is all things that are coming in the future, but don't get so wrapped up in all the evil that's going on in the world. You can't help but see it on the news. You can't help but hear it. But so many Christians, they don't talk about Jesus. They don't talk about his coming. They don't talk about his power. They just keep talking talk about this party, that party, this group, that group, uh, what's going on behind the scenes. The point of it is God knows what's going on behind the scenes. He's not ignorant. In fact, read Psalm 2 sometime. He's actually in their meetings they have in the White House, in the Congress, in the Kremlin, when they meet together and they're talking about overthrowing Christians, they're talking about overthrowing God, they're talking about world domination, all this stuff's going on. And it simply says in, in the second Psalm, he that sits in the heavens will laugh at them and have them in derision. In fact, not only does he laugh, the word derision means to chide them, make fun of them. He and Jesus punch each other and say, did you hear what they just said? They said they're going to overthrow us. They said they're going to overthrow the church. Can you believe that? They mean the church that Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against the answer is yes. They think they can overthrow these things. The point of it is they're not going to overthrow it. You can read the end of Revelation. You can read the end of Matthew chapter 25. We win. But the point of it is until then, you must develop patience. You must just operate in patience and understand God has it in his hands. And when the time comes, when God takes control over all this stuff that's happening on the earth, you're going to sit back and say, wow, I know it was prophesied, but I never th thought I'd see it on this type of level. Thank God I'm born again. Thank God I'm a child of God. And thank God there's an eternity out there for us. 
Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12 simply says this, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Matthew 24 is dealing with the end times, the times we're living in today. And it simply says there's going to come a time when believers are just going to get weary because why? They've got their attention focused on the world. I don't care if you watch the news. I watch the news sometime, but I've got to come back to it. I weigh the news with the news of the word of God. I weigh the bad news of the world with the good news of the gospel and realize there's coming a day when all this will end. And it may seem like a long way off for us, but it's a short time compared to eternity. Does God really care? When so much evil goes unpunished in our world today, how can evil people continue to prosper? But yet they do. In fact, this was something that David asked in the Old Testament. He didn't say, how come good people don't prosper? But how come the evil continue to prosper? And so he was talking about that. And he simply looked at the world and says, how can these evil people continue to prosper? Well, it's only temporary. The blessings of God toward the righteous will last forever, but toward the evil who steal it, take it away. There's coming a day they're going to lose at all. We see again, I've mentioned this, Christians are being beheaded, child sex slavery, those kids being brought over from other countries are being sold into slavery and parents don't see them again. Abortions, baby, adult parts being sold. We see all these things today and it just, it's atrocious what's happening. When will God take revenge for slavery, mass murders, tortures of Christians? When, Lord, will you do something? This is what the martyrs in heaven are crying out under the altar. When, Lord, will you do something? Notice this. This is even a cry in heaven. People that are there, their spirits that are there, even crying out, Lord, when will this come to an end? The point of it is you can know here before you get to heaven when it's going to end, how it's going to end, and the fact it's going to get worse before it gets better, and you might as well just suck it up and basically say, okay, Lord, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to keep doing what you've asked me to do. You promised in the midst of trials, tribulations, you promised that when war comes against me, you would be with me. And so, Lord, if war comes against me, I stand on your word. You promised you would never leave me nor forsake me. It may be different than what I'm seeing. I may have a hard time understanding understanding that, but I'm going to take your word by faith. You promised you would take care of me, but I want you to understand the thing. The things we're going through today has happened before, just not on the scale. We're seeing it begin to happen worldwide. It happened within certain nations. Israel was in, involved in that. And again, this has happened many times. Lord, when will you do something? Israel was in slavery for 400 years, and they kept trying during those 400 years, crying out to God, when, Lord, will you do something? Babies were killed at the birth of Moses, and they cried out, when, Lord? Babies were killed at the birth of Jesus, and they cried out, when, Lord? Saul of Tarsus and Nero killed hundreds of thousands of Christians, and there was cries going up everywhere, when, Lord? But even during that time, there was a huge group of people that stood up and said, I don't care what they're doing. We're going to do what God asked us to do. And the opening of the books of the Bible talk about that they, the, they were scattered everywhere, and that Greek word diaspora simply means they were scattered like seed. Oh, yeah, they scattered. Yes, they left Jerusalem. Yes, they left Israel, and they went into all the nations of the world but they didn't go there to sit down, sit down in their living room, close the windows and just sit there in fear. No, they went there to start churches, to evangelize. And so everywhere they went, they were like seed. One person left Jerusalem and multiplied themselves into hundreds and even thousands of people. In our own life, God rarely shows up early. Time helps to build patience and faith and trust in God. And this is what we need as Christians. Time also builds maturity and character. And time should help to build understanding of God's priorities, God's will in the earth. What is his priority? Another day gives time for one more sinner to be saved. And this is God's highest priority. His highest priority is not immediately turning the world situation around. It's another day to give somebody an opportunity to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And this is going to go right down until the very last day before Jerusalem is destroyed. He's going to still hold back. And on the day that Jerusalem is supposed to be destroyed, that's when he'll finally send the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that point on, it'll be too late for anybody to receive Jesus. But he's going to take it right down to the very last minute. And then he's going to show up. Another day again gives more time for sinners to be 
be saved. And this is told us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, and I'm quoting from the New Living Translation. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to get saved. God always gives mercy. God always is long suffering before judgment, but know that judgment will come. And at that time we will understand right now. We don't understand, but if you read the word of God, you may understand a little bit more. You'll never totally understand because it's like you look out there and suddenly all this stuff just hits you in the face of the evil that's going on in our world today. And you wonder, Lord, when are you going to finally do something about it? And you begin to understand the staggering size of of evil, that must mean we have a staggering size even greater of God's uh, will, God's love, God's judgment, God's mercy toward us, his judgment toward those who come against him and especially against his people. In the meantime, what are you supposed to do? Keep your eyes on the mission, not on the world. We're going to talk about where did evil begin because the Bible is filled with this teaching us where evil began. It didn't begin inside of a person. It began inside of a created being named Lucifer. Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us this. And again, I'm telling you this to help you understand where evil come from. You probably know many of you that are watching this broadcast have seen me and heard me teach on this before, but I need to reiterate because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's by the continual repetition of the word of God, hearing it over and over and over again. And there's been times I've sat down, you know, to hear a sermon by somebody and gone to church or, you know, listen to somebody, uh, you know, record and I'll start to listen and think, oh, I've heard this before, but you know what? I need to hear it again because when I hear it, I hear things I haven't heard the first time. It's not the same recording. It's, a, it's another recording, another message, but it's on the same subject. And after a while, you begin to think, I've heard this before. Listen, that is nothing but pride. That's nothing but stubbornness. There's no such thing as you've heard everything enough because you can hear it again and again and again. Peter even said, I will be ne- not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them. He was speaking to a congregation that he stood up to give a sermon. They said, oh, you've preached this before. He said, listen, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, even though you've heard it before. So I'm going to be talking to you here and I'll be, get into it in the, after the break here. Where did evil begin? How did it start? How did it develop into what it is today and what's going to be the end of it? We'll cover that when we come back. My book on understanding the end times brings out so much of this. And the reason why the book has been around for so many years, I've just changed the cover on it and changed it from one translation to another on the inside of the Bible. But the teaching has not changed at all. Why? Because end times haven't changed. God's will has not changed. And the reason why it's still around today, I don't prophesy when Jesus is going to come back because even he doesn't know exactly when he's going to come back until the time the rapture occurs. Then all mankind on this earth can look at the Bible and figure out how long the tribulation is going to last, especially those that are born again during that time period. So we'll be discussing that. And when we come back, we'll again go to Ezekiel chapter 28. If you want to open to that passage and we'll talk about where did evil begin. Understanding the end times, one of the most incredible and fascinating doctrines in the Word of God, will bring us comfort for the days in which we live. The Bible says we are to encourage and exhort one another with the knowledge of Jesus returning for His saints. In Understanding the End Times, Pastor Bob Yandian provides a thorough and exciting study to give you more revelation of these times in which we live. Topics include the Seven Dispensations, the dispensation of the mystery, the rapture of the church, the judgment seat of Christ, Daniel's 70 weeks, the temple discourse, the tribulation, the second coming, the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. To order Understanding the End Times, visit bobyandian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Using straightforward vocabulary and down-to-earth examples, Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, 
and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Ezekiel chapter 28, we're going to take a look at verses 12 through 17. And the reason why I'm bringing this out, and I've taught on this before, and many of you may say, but you've taught on this before. Listen, we need to hear it again. Because like I said, I'm just kind of getting fed up on the inside of me with the amount of biblical ignorance in the world today. And having to reiterate this over and over again, it simply comes back to this. You don't need to be that way. You can be one who can become an instructor of others. You say, well, I don't have a teaching gift. Well, you're to teach others. I don't have an instruction gift. You're still to instruct others. Well, when you talk to Christians that are falling apart at the seams, wondering what's going on, all the stuff behind the scenes, when is it ever going to end? When is God going to finally send Jesus back and take us out of here? When is Jesus ever going to come back and set up his kingdom on this earth? I can't tell you exactly because the Bible doesn't say exactly. Even Jesus said he didn't know the time that he was coming back. But it will be time and, and point at that time when the father turns to him and now says, it's time for you to go and receive the church. Then we will know once the church is gone and people on the earth will know exactly how long the tribulation is going to last. It's recorded in the book of Revelation, but you have to have a starting point And the starting point is the rapture of the church. So today, with all these things happening around us, God still has control. He created the universe. It's all held together by him. It all operates by him. So he has it under his control. Satan does not have it under his control. Temporarily he does, but there's limitations even placed on him by God. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 17. Son of man, God is talking here to Ezekiel. Take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. I want you to notice it goes on to say, it says, that you are a man and not a God and say to him, thus saith the Lord God, you are the seal, the sign, the template, the perfection. You were in Eden, the garden of God. And I want you to notice in this verse of scripture, he calls this being the king of Tyre. Contrast that to verse two, where he talks about the prince of Tyre. The king of Tyre is Satan himself who rules over Tyre. The prince of Tyre is the king who sits on the throne. So we basically have two rulers over Tyre as we do over nations. And we have those who sit on the throne called presidents or kings, monarchs, whoever they are, but over them sits someone else. And that is the powers of Satan. Above them is Satan himself. So he says here, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre is a title for Satan himself who rules over the nation. And then it says in back in verse two, he addresses the prince of Tyre. And it says of the prince of Tyre, you are a man and not a God. The prince of Tyre was a man seated on a throne that changes, but the king of Tyre never changes. That is Lucifer, Satan himself. He goes on to say, in that verse of scripture, that son of man take up a lamentation on the king of Tyre. We are addressing Satan himself, the one who not only controls individual nations through demons and through hierarchies of demons, but also controls the world's governments. And that's what we're seeing today is Satan who has been literally for centuries bringing the whole world up to this certain point is now releasing it. And we're seeing the world headed toward a centralized government. We're seeing the, the world headed toward a place where they control everything from finances to everything else in our life. They're going to be controlling it. And that is where it's headed to. But the point of it is God has an answer for them at the end of that time period called the tribulation. And it's the coming of Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom on this earth. And where Satan is an evil dictator, Jesus Christ will be a great provider, one who will rule the earth in peace and safety and love toward people, thinking of people. 
So he says again, son of man, take up a lamentation on the king of Tyre. This is Satan himself and say to him, thus says the Lord, you were the seal. The word seal means the signet or the template. It simply means if we want to go and see the original template of what goodness is and what perfection is, it would be Lucifer himself. Say to him, thus saith the Lord God, you are the seal, the signet, the template of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Notice this, the the prince of Tyre here, who is the king on the throne, has never been in Eden. This is talking about Lucifer himself. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald, and gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared in you in the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. The word covered here means governs. And this is not just one who covers something else. It's someone who covers a nation and he governs over a nation. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Notice this, the highest ranking angels in heaven are cherubim. And the highest ranking cherubim was Lucifer himself. He was the anointed cherub who covers. In other words, he was right under the Godhead. We have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Then we have Lucifer. Then we have uh, underneath him are the cherub. Underneath him are the seraphim right on down to the ranking angels here on earth that are part of those angels too. But they all came under one anointed cherub who was Lucifer himself. Verse 14 says again, you were the anointed cherub who covers or governs. I established you You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Lucifer is a created being. When he rose up against God, it was the creation trying to overthrow the creator, and it just doesn't happen. Verse 15 says, you were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. Iniquity didn't just suddenly come from nowhere. It was found inside of Lucifer. Notice in you until iniquity was found in you by the abundance of your trading. This is merchandise, riches, all found back in verse five. And it simply points out that Lucifer had control over all the earth and he had control over all the riches of the earth. And it says in verse 16, again, by the abundance of your trading, your merchandise, your riches, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before four kings so they might gaze upon you. Notice this, where did evil begin? Evil began in the heart of Lucifer. Evil was a decision. And so what happened was inside of Lucifer was the capability of turning against God, but he always said no. When God created angels, all of them had a will on the inside and their will was put to the challenge. Lucifer was challenged every single day when he saw all the beauty around him, when he saw his power, when he saw all the the amount of finances he was over, the business that he conducted, the entire earth he was over. And that's when it went to his head and he decided, I'm not only going to take over this earth as I've done. I'm going to take over God's own throne. And he rose up and went into heaven to overthrow God, but he did not have authority in heaven. He had authority over all the earth. And when he went into heaven, God just cast him out and God cast him to the ground and laid him before kings so they could just stare at him. At the time of the great Lisbon earthquake, this was in 1755, in the time of Russo and Voltaire, the people ran into the temple at the first tremor of an earthquake and a greater one caused the temple to collapse on them. The philosophers said if God could not stop the earthquake when people ran into his house, how are we expected to believe in him? And this became the catalyst of the French movement of secularism and atheism. In World War II, H.G. Wells said of the bombings in Europe, Either God has the power, but he doesn't care, or he cares and does not have the power. Eight undeniable truths are found in the Word of God, and I'm going to explain it to you. Does God have all power? Yes. Has God always had all power? Yes. Does God know everything? 
Yes. Did God create all things? Yes. Did God create Lucifer? Yes. When God created Lucifer, did he know he would become the devil? Yes. Could he have created him otherwise if he wanted to? The answer is yes. But does that make God responsible for sin? No. It was not found in God's heart, but the potential was inside of Lucifer's heart, and Lucifer could have said no, but he finally said yes to the temptation to overthrow God and to overtake his throne. But that doesn't make God responsible before it. I ask you another question. Does God know everything? The answer is yes. Did God know that Satan was going to do this or Lucifer would do this? Yes. Do you think God knew knew that and then has a plan to turn it around? The answer is yes. God is never taken by surprise. You can't turn against God and God go, I didn't know that was going to happen. Everything happening in the earth today, no matter what nation it is, does not take God by surprise. God is not responsible for sin. Lucifer was responsible for the original sin and passed it on to mankind. Again, does that make God responsible for sin? No. God created the being who would one day embody all evil. And he knew before he created him, he would be evil. As with you and all angels, God created Lucifer as a free moral agent. The choice to sin was found in Lucifer and he chose to sin. The the choice to sin was also found inside of angels and one third of the angels decided to go with Lucifer and two thirds decided to stay with God. It was presented to them as a once for all decision. If you decide to go, you can't come back. If you decide to stay with me, then you can't go after Lucifer one day. And they made their one time choice. But the point of it is we have choice. And when God placed us in this earth, he gave us a choice. And the choice is to hear the gospel and say yes or say no. We find examples in the Bible of two people who saw the same thing, heard the same thing, and yet one said yes and one said no to Jesus. And the first ones we find the word of God are the two that were crucified next to him, the two thieves who walked with him, heard him speak, went to the cross, heard him say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And one received him as Savior and the other one said no. We find again occasions throughout the word of God where these same things happen and one heard, the other heard, and one said yes and one said no. And this is society around us. We are not gonna be in hell because we sinned. We're not going to be in heaven because we didn't sin. We're going to be in heaven or hell for one reason. We either accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, or we rejected him. And just like Lucifer could choose and angels could choose, people can choose. But that's why we've been sent here to give the good news, to give the gospel to people. Some will say yes and some will say no. We can't control who says yes and who says no, but we can control the fact we can give them the good news and give to them and present present to them the opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ. If they do that, they'll have eternal life. Those names not found written in the book of life were cast in the lake of fire, but those names found written in the book of life, again, now get to go to heaven and be with Jesus Christ forever and forever. I simply ask you a question. Is your name found in the book of life? It's there because you say yes to Jesus Christ. I accept you as the Lord and the Savior of my life. And Father, I am now a Christian and I know I'm going to heaven because I received the author of eternal life, Jesus Christ himself. I'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.